welcome Accounting Boffins. You are with Ashraf Patel and the crew. Today, we're continuing with cash budgets. We're doing a revision question to ensure that you fully understand and grasp all the questions around cash budgets. Okay, so here we go. A quick recap. Remember when dealing with the cash budget, what did we say? We said that when we're dealing with a cash budget, we said that you're looking at receipts and payments. And when, you look, when you're working with a projected income statement, you are looking at your incomes and expenses. Remember the terminology, income that we have earned and expenses that we have incurred. Okay. So, once again, what is a projected income statement? A projected income statement is used to plan and predict the amount of profit the enterprise will generate through its future operations by setting out the estimated, estimated, remember, we are forecasting for the future. So, what are we forecasting? Our income and expenses for the forecast period. All right, okay. So now we are expected to indicate whether the following statements are true or false. A cash budget is prepared to show the actual receipts and payments for a specific period. What are we talking about? Cash budgets. So obviously, yes, we are talking about receipts and payments. So obviously, this will be the statement will be true. A projected income statement would reflect the expected profit or loss for the budget period. Once again, look at the terminology. They're talking about a projected income statement would definitely reflect your profit or loss for your budget period. Okay. Indicate whether the following statement is true or false. Only nominal accounts are recorded in the cash budget. Right, let's think about this one carefully. Is it only nominal accounts that appear in my cash budget? And the answer is actually false. Why? Because in my cash budget, I could get the purchase of land and buildings. Now, land and buildings is certainly not a nominal account. It's an asset account. Therefore, this statement would be false. And I'm explaining to you why it's false. Moving on to our question, we are now told that we have information relating to Z2 builders for the two months ended 30th of September 2020, right? So that's our budget period. Okay, what are we expected to do? We are expected to complete the debtors collection schedule, right? For the two months ended the 30th of September 2020. Now, this is when we talk about a debtors collection schedule. The emphasis is on credit sales. This is very, very important. The moment the question directs you towards a debtors collection schedule, immediately you know that to start completing that schedule, you need your credit sales. Right. Okay. Now, this is your monthly total sales that you are given here, right? And obviously, there's your actual and your budgeted. But remember, this is now total sales. Whereas your focus when you are doing a debtors collection schedule is your credit sales. Okay, now, a slight variation in this question. Look at the, look at the different method the examiner uses for this particular question. The question says, debtors pay according to the following trend. Right, remember we need, we need the trend to determine how we're going to draw up our debtors collection schedule. So therefore, 50% pay in the month following the month of sale. In other words, if you sold in June, in July you will collect 50% of that debt. Then they give you an unknown percentage pay in the second month following the month of sale. An unknown percentage is given to you. So in this particular instance, you can clearly see you have been working, you, Ophay, 
you know that generally you are told 50%, 20%, 18%, whatever the percentages may be. But in this particular activity, or in this particular question, you don't know the percentage that you have to calculate on, right? But like we say, don't fear when Ashraf is near. Because I'm going to show you how you go about doing a question of this nature. Okay, so the same applies to your, the, the month thereafter is also an unknown. And then you are told that 2% is written off as irrecoverable. Okay, so the, this is the trend in which our debtors will be paying us. Right, so immediately we go on to the question and we say, right, fine. Now look at the information that you have, right? You are told that this is your credit sales figure, which is exactly what we want. So we have our credit sales figure, right? We are also told that in May, I have my credit sale, right? Now remember what was the trend? They pay you 50% in the month after the month of sale. Thereafter, they pay you an unknown percentage, then they pay you an unknown percentage, and then you write off the 2% as irrecoverable. So my question to you is, looking at May, how will May impact on my budget period? So if I sold for credit in May, some of the debt, the 50% of the debtors will pay in June, right? A percentage will pay in July, a percentage will pay in August, and eventually you'll write off the 2% as irrecoverable. So here you can see that May will be June, July, and August. So obviously, this is not going to impact on your September figure. That means by that time, you'll be writing off the, the, the debt as irrecoverable, right? Meaning it will be your bad debt. Okay, but keep that in mind because later on the question may ask us to calculate the bad debt. Okay, now look at June. June's credit sales figure is 300,000, right? So there's my 300,000 as my figure for June. What am I told? I'm told that 50% will pay me in the month after the month of sale. So in other words, June, in July, I'm going to be receiving the 50%, right? In August, I'm going to be receiving a percentage, but I don't know what is the percentage, right? In previous question, you, you were given the percentage, but watch, look at the information that you have. Here we go. You are told that in August, you are receiving 90,000, right? So watch my calculation very closely here. What do I take? I take my 90,000 that I'm receiving, okay? I'm taking the 90,000 that I'm receiving over the credit sale of 300,000, right? And I'm going to express it as a percentage. So what I do is I take the 90,000 times 100, because I want, to, I, want to, I want to express this as a percentage, right? So watch, I take my 90,000 times 100 divided by the figure of 300,000, okay? And that will give me a percentage of 30%. I repeat, because of its importance, Number one, take the amount that you are receiving, which is the 90,000, right? So there we go. Take the 90,000. Take your 90,000 over the 300,000, which is my, um, the credit sale, times 100 over 1. Obviously, it will give me, like we calculated, it will give me a percentage of 30%. Okay? So there we go. I've got the 30% now. This indicates what to me? That the percentage that I'm receiving, we said 50% in the month after the month of sale, thereafter 
I'm receiving 30%. And how did I do it? Based on the, can you see, June's figures are filled in for you. And that's where the, the actual crux of the question came in. Because if you didn't understand that, you would be unable to do further calculations. Right? So therefore, looking at June now, you can clearly see that we've indicated that June, obviously we know July will be the 50%, right? August will be what we've calculated to be the 30%, right? Let us now do September, right? Understand, we're still working with the credit sale of June, right? What do we do? Same procedure. Here goes. We take the 54,000, 54,000, right? times 100, remember we want to express as a percentage, divided by the original figure, which is your credit sale of 300,000, and that will give you a figure of 18%. In other words, you can clearly now see what is your trend in terms of your calculations. Once again, 50% in the month after the month of sale. So, if you looked at June, right, obviously they did not give you July, but obviously you can see from June you went into August. That was the month after that month. So the first month was the 50%, which we would have received in July, obviously. But in August, we're receiving the 30%, and you saw and actually showed you how we calculated the 30%, right? And then obviously in September, Based on your June credit sale, you are now receiving the 18%. And you can clearly see now that your June figure, how will it impact in September? It will be the 2% that you will write off as irrecoverable. So, accounting boffins out there, you had to use the given information in order to determine your trend. And as we have now seen, we know our trend is what? 50% in the month after the month of sale. Thereafter, it's 30%. The month thereafter and the month thereafter is 18%. And then eventually, you write off your 2%. Okay, now once we've, once we've calculated that, once we've ascertained that we know exactly how to work out our trend, the rest, of the, the rest of it becomes easy, isn't it? Piece of cake, chocolate cake, my favorite. Okay, here we go. So now, it's very simple. You're going to take your June figures, right? And you're going to calculate the impact on August and on September. And here you can clearly now see that Yes, this is just information regarding your receipts. They're telling you that if it, obviously if the cash sales is 150,000 Rand for August, 75% is your credit sales. You can clearly see that 25% of those total sales will be your cash sales, right? Again, information that's provided to you. So if we now look at our completed debtors collection schedule. This is what we have here. Take your 375,000, right? If you take your 375,000, 375,000, obviously we know that that's July, they'll pay in August will be times your 50%. And here we go, you're gonna get 187. 500. If you take July's figure, multiply it by the 30%, let's do that. Take the July figure, 375,000 times your 30%. Clearly, you can see that it's 112,500. So in this case here, clearly you can see that once you've ascertained your percentages, it becomes easy to calculate. You know July, that is your 50%. Let's put it there. That will be your 30%. August, if you take 450, we know the month thereafter is the 50%. So in this way, you now complete your debtors collection schedule. Here you can see, here's our, 
other question that we referred to early on, where you had to calculate the bad debts. Now remember, what did we say? We said that 2% is written off as irrecoverable. Looking at my calculation, your sale was 262,500 times the 2%. Clearly, you can see that the amount of bad debts will be 5,250. So, what was important in this segment was to ascertain, firstly, the 50% was given to you, we calculated the 30%, we calculated the 18%, 50 plus 30 is 80, 98, and there's your 2% bad debt. So these are your percentages that will be effective in terms of your trend. Okay. In summary, when you are doing a debtors collection schedule, most important figure is your credit sales. Once you've ascertained your credit sales, you now look at your trend. What is my trend? What are my percentages? And then you just go to back to your credit sales, calculate your percentages, and voila, you've got your answer. Okay? Let's take a quick break. Let's refresh, and we'll see you in a jiffy. Welcome back, accounting boffins, right? Remember, we're busy with a question on cash budgets. A quick recap, when you are dealing with budgets, please note, ask yourself the question. And in accounting, there's another trick for you for the exams, an examination tip. In accounting, you have to be mad. What do I mean by that? Talk to yourself. Sometimes you need good advice, right? So talk to yourself. Ask yourself, talk to yourself and say, right, what is required here? What am I expected to do? Remember what we said? If you're doing the cash budget, you're looking at receipts and payments. And if, you are, if the question is based on, on the projected income statement, then clearly you're looking at incomes and expenses. Okay. Also take into consideration, it's a forecasting tool which we actually use. It's not something that is prepared and put away. No, we refer to it on a continuous basis to see what action we need to take in order to avoid us having a situation where we have a cash deficit, okay, or a loss. Right, now, we are expected to calculate missing figures indicated by A to D in the incomplete cash budget. All right, so my focus is my cash budget. Let's look at it and see. There's my cash budget. As you can see, there are missing figures. Now, just before we go into the missing figures, just to draw your attention to the cash budget. Remember, under your receipts, you're going to have all your cash items. As you can see, cash sales, collections from debtors. Now, remember, in the previous segment, we did the debtors collection schedule. That debtors collection schedule will fit into my cash budget. Can you see collections from debtors? Now, obviously, we calculated those figures, so that will fit into my cash budget, right? Fixed deposit, clearly you can see this is a fixed deposit that has matured, meaning money has come into the business, right? It could also appear under payments when we take money out of our, our bank account and put it into a fixed deposit. Okay, then we have interest on the fixed deposit and then you have sundry cash income. Under payments, you've got cash purchase of trading stock, payments to creditors, salaries and wages, equipment, manager salary, interest on loan. Okay, so this is just an, an extract of the cash budget. What are we expected to calculate? Firstly, the cash sales for September. What information do we have? We are told that our total sales amounts to 800,000 Rand. Credit sales amounts to 75% of the total sale, clearly giving you an indication that your cash sale has to be 25%. How do I get that? Clearly, 100% total sales minus credit sales of 
75% will then give me my 25% cash sales. So this is what I do. Immediately I say, fine, take out my calculator. There we go. 800,000 is my total sales, right? Times the 25%, which will now be my cash sales. And there we go. 200,000 is my cash sales for the month of September. So here now, if I now go and look at my calculation, their cash sales, I slot in the 200,000, which was a required in terms of my question. Got it? So determine cash sales, credit sales, percentages, and then the calculation. Right. The next thing that I have to calculate now is my cash purchase of trading stock. Let's see information that we have. Information regarding purchases. Okay. In this question, the examiner was kind to you. They gave you the purchases figure. But remember, whenever you're calculating either cash purchase of trading stock or payments to creditors, the most important figure you have to calculate is your cost of sales. Once you have calculated your cost of sales, you then break it up into cash purchases and credit purchases. And the reason we do that is because in our questions, we use what is called base stock. What is base stock? Base stock simply means whatever stock you start off with at the beginning of the month is the stock that you will end off at the end of the month. So whatever you Whatever stock leaves the business is the stock that will be bought to replenish so that we have the same amount of stock at the beginning of the next month. Got that? Brilliant. Okay, so here we go. We are told that 40% of all purchases are for cash, right? Here we have our purchases figure and we are also told that creditors are paid in full after 30 days to take advantage of a 5% discount. We'll come to you later. Right now, let's focus on the question at hand, which is the cash purchases. So, this is what we do. Remember, we want cash purchases for August. So, the first thing that you do is you determine your August figure for purchases, which is 550000 Once you've ascertained and you've got the 550000 very simple, 550000 is your, is, is your total purchases, you want cash purchases, which is 40% of that figure, and there you go, 220,000 is your cash purchases for that month. Let's look at our cash budget. Here we go, 220,000 as a payment, we slot it in, there's my 220,000, which is my cash purchases of trading stock. Once again, when you, are when you are expected to calculate either cash purchases or payments to creditors, hone in, aim at cost of sales. Split up the cost of sales then into cash purchases and credit purchases and thereafter do your calculations. But depending on the information, in this particular question, you were given the purchases, so it was not necessary to calculate your cost of sales. Right, please check and make sure that you read the full question. Okay, in C, payments to creditors, right? We did say we're going to come back to this one here. Let's see what we have here. We want our payments to creditors for September. So, in terms of the proviso, we are told creditors are paid in full after 30 days to take advantage or a, of a 5% discount. So, you're paying in 30 days, it means you're paying the month thereafter. So clearly you can see that you will now need to work on the 550,000 because what you pay, what you bought for in August, right? The 550,000. The amount that you, you, that you will pay for cash obviously will be in August, but the credit component you'll pay in the month thereafter. So. Obviously, you start off with the 550,000. Here we go. Take your total purchases figure of 550,000 
And then what we do is, step number one, 550,000 is a figure that we are working with. Work out your credit component. What percentage was bought on credit? Remember, 40% was cash. So obviously, 60% would be the amount that you are buying on credit. Okay, so multiply that by 60%. Let's do that. Okay, there we go. We've got our 60%. Now, now, what's this calculation? Once you've ascertained your credit purchases, like we have, which is 330,000, Okay, now, what percentage are you paying? Because the question clearly said you were given a 5% discount. So clearly, you're only going to settle 95% of that amount. Because we're settling our accounts promptly, we're taking advantage of the 5% discount. While we're on the discount, Remember, a discount allowed and discount received does not feature in my cash budget. Reason, they are non-cash items. However, discount allowed and discount received will feature in my projected income statement. Discount allowed as an operating expense and discount received as an operating income. Okay, that was just by the way, but important. Okay, so here we go. So we said 330,000 was a 60% times the 95%, which is the amount we're going to be settling. And there we go. 313,500 is the amount that we will be paying our creditors. Watch what we do. Here we go. 313,500 is slotted into my cash budget as my payment to my creditor. Okay. What have you noticed? That when you are working out your your cash purchases or your payments to creditors. You, the figure that you finally work with is the purchases figure, right? But like I alluded to early on, depending on the information that is given to you, very often examiners ask you to first calculate the cost of sales and then move on to the purchases, but obviously depending on the question. Now what do we have to calculate? We have to calculate D. And that is our interest on the loan, right? Let's look at the information that we have. A loan of 800,000 was negotiated with Bob Investors at 18% per annum. Interest on the 31st of December 2019, right? Interest is not capitalized. Okay, when we're talking about capitalization of interest, I think it's important at this stage, for me to give you a quick explanation of capitalization of interest. When interest is capitalized, all that it means is that the interest is added back to your loan account, right? So what's your entry when you're processing interest on loan? You debit interest on loan, which is your expense account, and you credit to your loan account. Watch here. Now, obviously, this is as, as is more applicable to the adjustments, but I think it's important for you to understand the concept of capitalization of interest. So here's your interest on loan, right? There's your loan account. So if you're capitalizing the interest, you're debiting your interest on loan, which is your expense, and you're crediting your loan account, meaning the interest is being capitalized. It's added back to the loan account, okay? So keep that in mind. When they're talking about capitalization of interest, this is what we mean. Okay. All right? In terms of the question, we are told that the interest is payable every three months on the 31st of March, June, and September, and the 31st of December, commencing on the 31st of March, 2020. Okay. So here we go. Interest on loan start with 800,000, which is the capital portion of my loan. Therefore, this is what I do. Start off with the 800,000. 800,000 is the amount of my loan. Okay, now, the rate of the interest was 18%. So obviously, you're going to multiply this by your rate. Take into consideration what we've always said, art, amount, rate, and time. So the amount is 800,000. As you can see, my rate is uh, 18%. 
and my time in this case here will be the 3 over 12. Right. So whenever you're doing any interest-based calculation, right, or you're doing a calculation on depreciation, always take into account art, amount, rate, and time. It's very important to get used to this calculation. Okay, so if we look at our calculation, it's 800,000 times the 18%. Let's do that. Will give me a figure of uh, 144,000 times 3 divided by 12. And clearly you can see your amount is 36,000 Rand, meaning it will be paid off Every three months, you'll be paying off an amount of 36,000 Rand. Now, in this particular one, how does it impact on our cash budget? Let's see. There we go. Clearly, you can see in September, which is one of the months in which the payment will be made, we will be making a payment of 36,000 Rand. Okay. So, what have we done? We've sub we've, we have successfully completed the missing figures. That was A... B, C, and D. And in this way, you can clearly see we have now completed all our calculations. All right. I think a whole lot of calculations has caused a bit of tiring amongst all of us. Concentration levels. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, we'll be refreshed to do our last segment. See you just now. Welcome back, accounting boffins. I'm sure you had a good break. And we're ready for the last segment of today's lesson. Right. We're busy with a question on cash budgets. We've seen how we had to use information to work out the trend when working out your debtor's collection schedule. Let's just go through that very quickly. Number one, a debtor's collection schedule, you know you need credit sales. Once you've ascertained your credit sales, you now look at the trend. How are my debtors paying me? In other words, the percentages, right? So that trend will then give you an indication on how to complete your debtors collection schedule. Right, number two. When you're doing a creditors payment schedule, remember, what do you need? You need your purchases figure, right? And we're using the assumption that we're using base stock, meaning we replenish stock on a monthly basis. So whatever stock leaves during the month is the amount of stock that we will buy to ensure that we start off with the same amount of stock for the beginning of the next month. Okay, so that purchases figure is dependent on your cost of sales. But in the question that we were dealing with, we were given the purchases figure, meaning you did not have to calculate the cost of sales, but be prepared under examination conditions to calculate the cost of sales and then work out your purchases figure. Then you split up your purchases into cash and credit purchases. Okay, next part of the question. The question now says, all right, let's look at the question. It says here, required, calculate the percentage increase in the amount budgeted for salaries and wages for September 2020. The question further says the workers are threatening to go on strike, right? So let's see what they're saying here. They're threatening to go on strike for a higher wage increase. Do you think that they are justified in their grievance? Explain your answer. Okay, so this therefore means that you have to first do a calculation, then you have to look at the grievance and see whether they are justified in their action for, for, for asking for strike action or for going on strike action. Okay, so here we go. Let's look at the information. You have salaries and wages. There's the salaries and wages component. Let's firstly isolate it. So step number one, look at the salary for September, which is 48,600. Compare it to the previous months, and that was 45,000. So step number one, what do you do? 
You take your 48,600, right? Take your 48,600 minus your 45,000, subtract your 45,000, right? Clearly you can see the difference between that will be 3,600. So, step number one, calculate the difference between the two months. It is important that you learn method, right? So, what, what have I done? I took my 48,600, which was the month of September, and I subtracted the August figure. Clearly, you can see there's my calculation to give me my 3,600. What is the 3,600? The difference between the two months. Okay, now, once I have my 3,600, I take my 3,600 over the base year. That means over the, 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 the month, in, I said base year if you're working in years, or the base month if you're working for, the, for different months. So the month in which the increase took place was September. The month before that obviously was the 45,000. Multiply that by 100 over 1 to give you a percentage. Let's do that. Okay. Here goes. It's 3,600 times 100 divided by 45,000. And that will give you a figure of 8%. In other words, there was an increase of 8% in our salaries for the workers. There was an increase of 8%. Now, do you think they are justified in their grievance? Explain. When a question says, do you think they are justified? Explain. It does not just require a yes, no answer. You need to give a yes, no answer correct, but you need to explain that answer. In other words, the answer in this case is no. And why is it no? Because 8% is definitely above the inflation rate. Okay, so what is important, right, is to look at the context of the inflation rate. Currently, your inflation rate is, is hovering at about 2.7 or, or, or just under 3%, right? So what we're saying is that it, under these conditions, under today's conditions, my answer would obviously be no, because if you're getting an 8% increase and inflation is, is hovering at about 3%, it is well above the inflation rate. So they have no uh, reason to behave in the, way, in the manner that they are behaving, because they have received an increase well above the inflation rate. However, if the inflation rate was 12%, Watch how it changes your answer. Now your answer is yes, they have a grievance. Why? Because they're only receiving 8%, but the inflation rate is at 12%. So obviously workers have cause for concern. Look at the context of the question. All right. Now, we then went further and said, um, if you compare the percentage increase for the manager's salary, let's look at the manager now, and look at the manager's salary, step number one, 47150, let's do that. Let's take the 47150, 47150 minus the 41,000, right, which was the previous month, will give you a figure of 6,150. Therefore, what we do, we take the 6,150, over the 41,000, which was the previous month, times 100 over 1, we're expressing it as a percentage, and now you find that the manager's salary has increased by 15%. Can you see a different angle to the question? So this is where you are expected now to make a comparison between the wages increase for the normal workers and the manager. Clearly, you can see there is a case now for the for their grievance. Why? Because the manager is getting a 15% increase while they are only getting an 8% increase. It is a clear indication 
of disparity of increases. And that is why it is important that you have committees set up in your workplaces where all of these things are then negotiated. There must be transparency, right? So that you can then, obviously, if you have a remunerations committee set up who would look at things like this here, obviously this would then result in there being understanding between all the employees within our firm so that, it is, that there's a fair and equitable increase to everybody. Right, so in this particular example that we have here, we can clearly see that there's disparity. Why? 8% and compare it to the manager is your 15%. Clearly cause for concern. What needs to happen is these two need to get closer to one another. In other words, the 8 and the 15, so that obviously you have a situation where all your employees are happy. Remember, happy employees make happy customers. And that's why in any business, when it comes to service delivery, which is so fundamental in, in our economy today, we have to ensure that our consumers are kept happy at all times. Right. So, what is important, uh, just to summarize the, the, the figures that we've worked out, look at the information that you have here. You have to identify the salaries and wages. You have to identify the manager's salary. And once you've identified those two, you would then make your comparisons based on the answers that you get. Okay, a question now arises that if perchance you make an error in your calculation, right? Remember as examiners, if there's an error in your calculation and you use the incorrect answers in justifying your explanations, you will be awarded the marks. Listen carefully to what I'm saying. That perchance, if you make an error in your calculation, but you use that incorrect calculation to justify your answer, you will get rewarded, marks will be allocated to that incorrect answer based on the incorrect calculation. So the double penalty principle is not applied. But most important is to show your calculations. Okay, we now move on to the next part of the question where we are told that a local town councillor has offered to recommend Z2 Builders Hardware to supply building materials to the value of a million rand in the extension of a local municipality. However, he will only do this if Zokeli pays him 10% of the total value in cash, give two reasons why Zokeli should not accept this offer. Okay. Number one, read the context of the question. Look at what is being given to you. Now, very often, very often, this type of question, right, requires you to analyze and then make judgment or evaluate the question and then give a decision based on what we know. So, let's establish the facts first. Number one, the local town councillor has offered to recommend, that means they want to do something on our behalf. No problem. However, the councillor will only do this if Zokele pays him 10% of the total value in cash. Clearly you can see, clearly you can see that this is unethical. It is something that should not be happening in our economy because there should be fair competition there should be tenders out there, and everybody should have a right to tender, and obviously the person with the, with the best tender or, and the person who does the best job should be able to get the contract. Okay, look at our responses. One, number one, this is actually a bribe which is unethical, right? We've said that. It is unethical to do something like this. Why? Because it's a bribe. The person has said, only if you give me 10% in cash will I recommend you. Unethical, unacceptable in terms of business practice. 
uneth unethical in terms of life practices. Okay, if this information is made public, it will have a negative effect on the business in the future. Clearly, if this information becomes uh, public knowledge, people will now start doubting you as a business, thinking that you're only dealing with unethical practices. And this will then have a negative connotation on your business. Right? Then, Zokele must tender formally at the municipality to secure the contract through the normal processes. Remember, I alluded to this. Follow the normal channels of handing in a tender at the municipality, and if you get it, good luck, then it was meant for you, but you're following normal processes. And in this way here, look at the benefit for both Zakele and the municipality, because at the end of the day, if we were to go the other route, the unethical route, 10% of that money, which could have been used as a discount to somebody or an additional donation is now being usurped by somebody for their personal benefit. Nobody, the business is not benefiting. Yes, they're benefiting with the sale, but the municipality is actually losing out in the long run. So what do we have to do here? We have to follow the normal, formal procedures. And in, in, in this way, you can clearly see that it will be beneficial to everybody and the entire economy. Okay, guys, that's it for today's lesson. A quick recap, make sure you are able to do a debtors collection schedule, a creditors payment schedule, calculations, and you are able to answer questions based on real life situations. The, the situation here with regard to the, the possible bribe is something that affects our daily lives. And it's something that we all have to stand up and say, enough, we do not want any corruption in our country. From me, Ashraf Patel and the team, have a good, good break, but practice your accounting. Make sure that when you are working, you are always taking the other types of questions into consideration in, in preparation for your exams. Keep your feet on the ground, Reach for the stars. Goodbye.